ask. To hold the will firm is like having a pain in the heart, as the whole mind is concentrated on the pain. How can there be time for idle talk or being a busybody? The teacher said, this is good as an initial effort, but the student must be made to understand that the spiritual intelligence of the mind comes in and goes out at no definite time and without anyone's knowing its direction, and that it is originally this way. Only in this way can one's effort find a solution. If one merely holds his will rigidly, I am afraid his effort will encounter trouble. I ask, if one confines his effort entirely to self-cultivation and does not devote himself to study, one is likely to mistake his desires for the principle of nature. What can be done? The teacher said, one must understand the true meaning of learning. To study is nothing but self-cultivation. Not to study merely means that one's will to self-cultivation is not sufficiently serious or concrete. What is meant by understanding the true meaning of learning? Suppose you tell me what learning is for and what there is to learn. I have heard you teach us saying that to learn is to learn to preserve the principle of nature, that the original substance of the mind is the principle of nature, and that in order personally to realize this, it is merely necessary to have no selfish wishes in one's mind. Then it is only necessary to overcome and get rid of selfish wishes. Why worry about not understanding principle and desires? I am simply afraid that the selfish wishes are not truly recognized. It is all because the will is not yet serious or concrete. If it is, all the eye sees and all the ear hears will be directed toward the selfish desires. How is it possible that they cannot be truly recognized? All people have the sense of right and wrong. One need not seek it outside. The study means merely personally to realize what one's mind has seen. It is not to look for something to be seen outside of the mind. The teacher asked friends who were present about their recent progress in learning. One friend mentioned the idea of mind being clear, calm, and free from material desires. The teacher said, this refers to the condition of learning. Another friend spoke about the similarity and difference of past and present efforts in learning. The teacher said, this refers to the effect of learning. The two friends did not know what to say and asked for an explanation. The teacher said, our effort today consists in being genuine and concrete in our determination to do good. If our determination is genuine and concrete, we will immediately advance to do good whenever we see it and immediately correct ourselves whenever we make a mistake. Only in this way do we have genuine and concrete effort. The selfish human desires will gradually decrease and the principle of nature will be increasingly understood. If we merely go after the condition or the effect of learning, we are not making a real effort, but are committing the error of forcing the growth of the mind and pursuing external things. When friends studied, many selected Jushi for criticism. The teacher said, This is purposely to find disagreement. It is wrong. When at times my ideas are different from those of Wei'an, it is because I had to argue for my position so that the student may not make an infinitesimal mistake in the beginning and end up with an infinite error. But my ultimate purpose and that of Hui An are not different. For the rest, where his statements and explanations are clear and appropriate, why does a single word of his need to be altered? Tai Se Yuan asked, Sagehood can be achieved through learning. But the abilities and efforts of sages, Ho Yi and 
E Ying are after all different from those of Confucius. Why are they called sages? The teacher said, The reason the sage has become a sage is that his mind has become completely identified with the principle of nature and is no longer mixed with any impurity of selfish human desires. It is comparable to pure gold. It retains its purity because its golden quality is perfect and is no longer mixed with copper or lead. A man must have reached the state of being completely identified with the principle of nature before he becomes a sage, and gold must be perfect in quality before it becomes pure. However, the abilities of sages differ in degree, just as the several pieces of gold quantitatively differ in weight. The sage emperors Yao and Shun may be compared to 10,000 pounds, King Wen and Confucius. 9,000 pounds. King Yu, 2,183 to 2,175 BC. Tang, 1,751-1,739 BC. Wen and Wu, 7 or 8,000 pounds. And Po Yi and Yi Ying, 4 or 5,000 pounds. Their abilities and efforts differ but in being completely identified with the principle of nature, they were the same, and all may be called sages. It's just like the several pieces of pure gold, which may be so called because they are qualitatively perfect, although quantitatively different. Mix a 5,000 pound piece of gold with a 10,000 pound piece, and their quality remains the same. Put Po Yi and Yi Ying beside Yao and Confucius, and their complete identification with the principle of nature is the same. For it to be pure gold depends not on quantity, but on perfection and quality, and to be a sage depends not on ability or effort, but on being completely identified with the principle of nature. Therefore, even an ordinary person, if he is willing to learn so as to enable his mind become completely identified with the principle of nature and also become a sage in the same way that although a one ounce piece when compared with a 10,000 pound piece is widely different in quantity it is not sufficient in perfection and quality this is why it is said that every man can become Yao and Shun in learning to become a sage a student needs only to rid of selfish human desires and preserve the principle of nature, which is like refining gold and achieving perfection and quality. If the deficiency in purity is not substantial, the work of refining is simple and success is easily attained. The lower the proportion of purity is, the more difficult the work becomes. In the matter of purity and impurity of physical nature, some men are above average and some are below. With reference to the sage's doctrines, some are born with the knowledge of them and can practice them naturally and easily, while others learn them through study and practice them for their advantage. Those below the average must make 100 efforts where others make one. And 1,000 efforts, where others make 10, but the success of all of them is the same. Later generations do not realize that the foundation for becoming a sage is to be completely identified with the principle of nature, but instead seek sagehood only in knowledge and ability. They regard the sage as knowing all and being able to do all, and they feel they have to understand all the knowledge and ability of the sage before they can succeed. Consequently, they do not direct their efforts toward the principle of nature, but merely cripple their spirit and exhaust their energy in scrutinizing books, investigating the names and varieties of things, and imitating the forms and traces of the acts of the ancients. As their knowledge becomes more extensive, their selfish desires become more numerous, and as their abilities become greater and greater, 
the principle of nature becomes increasingly obscured from them. Their case is just like that of a person who, seeing someone else with a piece of pure gold of 10,000 pounds, does not take steps to refine his own so that in the quality of purity his will not yield to that of the other person, but foolishly hopes to match the 10,000 pound piece in quantity. He throws in mixed elements of pewter, lead, brass, and iron, with the result that the greater the quantity, the lower the degree of purity, in the end it is no longer gold at all. At that time, Chu Ai was by the side of the teacher and remarked, This analogy of yours will effectively destroy the delusions of the famous but mediocre scholars who advocate the study of isolated details and is a great help to us students. The teacher further said, In making effort, we want to diminish every day rather than to increase every day. If we reduce our selfish human desire a little bit, to that extent we have restored the principle of nature. How enjoyable, and how free, how simple, and how easy. Yang Shi Te asked, The theory of the investigation of things as you have taught it, is clear, simple, and easy. Everyone can understand it. How is it that King Wen Kong, Zhu Xi, failed to understand the theory, although he was unsurpassed in intelligence? The teacher said, Wen Kong's mental energy and vigor were great, because from the beginning, when he was young, he had already made up his mind to continue the heritage of the past and to enlighten future generations. All along, he directed his efforts only to intellectual investigation and writing. Naturally, he would have had no time for these if he had given priority to self-cultivation with a sense of genuine and personal concern. After he had reached the state of eminent virtue, he had really worried lest the doctrine not be made clear to the world and following the example of Confucius's retiring to edit the six classics, had eliminated superfluous works and confined himself to the simple and essential in order to enlighten later scholars. In general, it would not have required him to do much investigation. When he was young, he wrote many books and then repented doing so in his old age. That was doing things upside down. Shita said, repented in his old age. For instance, he said that he realized the mistake of adhering to the traditionally accepted text of the great learning, that book reading did not help his task, and that his task had nothing to do with holding on to books or adhering rigidly to words. These statements show that when he reached old age, he began to regret the mistakes of his previous effort and to direct his new effort toward self-cultivation in the sphere of genuine and personal concern. The teacher said, correct, this is where we cannot match Wen Kong. His energy being great, once he regretted, he immediately turned around. Unfortunately, before long, he passed away, not living long enough to correct the many mistakes he had made during his lifetime. I was pulling leaves out from among the flowers and thereupon said how difficult it is in the world to cultivate good and remove evil. The teacher said, only because no effort is made to do so. A little later, he said, such a view of good and evil is motivated by personal interest and is therefore easily wrong. I did not understand. The teacher said, The sphere of life of heaven and earth is the same in flowers and weeds. Where have they the distinction of good and evil? When you want to enjoy flowers, you will consider flowers good and weeds evil. But when you want to use weeds, 
evil then consider them good such good and evil are all products of the mind's likes and dislikes therefore i know you are wrong i asked in that case there is neither good nor evil is that right the teacher said the state of having neither good nor evil is that of the principle in tranquility good and evil appear when the vital force is perturbed if the vital force is not perturbed there is neither good nor evil and this is called the highest good i asked the buddhists also deny the distinction between good and evil are they different from you the teacher said being attracted to the non-distinction of good and evil the buddhists neglect everything and therefore are incapable of governing the world the sage on the other hand in his non-distinction of good and evil really makes no special effort whatsoever to like or dislike and is not perturbed in his vital force as he pursues the kingly path and sees the perfect excellence he of course completely follows the principle of nature and it becomes possible for him to assist in and complete the universal process of production and reproduction and apply it for the benefit of the people if weeds are not evil, they should not be removed. This, however, is the view of the Buddhists and Taoists. If they are harmful, what is the objection to removing them? That would be a case of making special effort to like or to dislike. Not making a special effort to like or to dislike does not mean not to like or dislike at all. A person behaving so be devoid of consciousness to say not to make a special effort really means that one's likes and dislikes completely follow the principle of nature and that one does not go on to attach to that situation a bit of selfish thought this amounts to having neither likes nor dislikes how can weeding be regarded as completely following the principle of nature without any attachment selfish thought if weeds are harmful according to principle they should be removed then remove them that is all if for a moment they are not removed one should not be troubled by it if one attaches to that situation a bit of selfish thought it will be a burden on the substance of his mind and his vital force will be much perturbed in that case Good and evil are not present in things at all. They are only in your mind. Following the principle of nature is good, while perturbing the vital force is evil. After all, then, things are devoid of good and evil. This is true of the mind. It is also true of things. Famous but mediocre scholars fail to realize this. They neglect the mind and chase after material things and consequently get a wrong view of the way to investigate things all day long they restlessly seek principle in external things they only succeed in getting at it by incidental deeds of righteousness all their lives they act in this way without understanding it and do so habitually without examination how about loving beautiful color and hating bad odor this is all in accord with principle we do so by the very nature of the principle of nature from the beginning there is no selfish desire to make a special effort to like or dislike how can the love of beautiful color and the hatred of bad color not be regarded as one's own will the will in this case is sincere, not selfish. A sincere will is in accord with the principle of nature. However, while it is in accord with the principle of nature, at the same time it is not attached in the least to selfish thought. Therefore, when one is affected to any extent by wrath or 
on this, the mind will not be correct. It must be broad and impartial. Only thus is it in its original substance. Knowing this, we know the state of equilibrium before feelings are aroused. Wang Hoshang said, You said that if weeds are harmful, according to principle, they should be removed. Why should the desire to remove them be motivated by personal interest? You must find this out yourself through personal realization. What is your state of mind when you want to remove the weeds? And what was the state of mind of Chou Ma Shu, Chou 20, 1017 to 73, when he would not cut down the grass outside his window? The teacher said to students, when one devotes himself to study, he must have a basis. Only then can his effort lead to any solution, even though his effort may not be uninterrupted. He will have a definite direction, like a boat with a rudder. The mere mention of the subject will immediately wake him up. Otherwise, although he devotes himself to study, he can only accomplish something through the incidental accumulation of righteousness. He will only act without understanding and do so habitually without examination. This is neither a great foundation nor the universal way of virtue. He again said, if one understands, no matter how he says it, he is right. If what he says is right in one respect, but not in another, it is because he has not understood. Someone said, for the sake of parents, a student cannot avoid the burden of preparing for the civil service examination. The teacher said, if taking the examinations for the sake of parents is a burden to one's study, then is farming for the sake of parents also a burden to study? A former elder said, the danger of the civil service examination lies in its destroying one's will to study. The only fear is that one's will to study may not be genuine. Ouyang Cheng Yi asked, Ordinarily, one's mind is much flustered. It is so whether we are occupied or not. Why? The teacher said, In the dynamic operation of the material force of the universe, there is from the beginning not a moment of rest, but there is the master. Consequently, the operation has its regular order and it goes on neither too fast nor too slowly. The master, that is, the wonderful functioning of creation, is always calm in spite of hundreds of changes and thousands of transformations. This process makes it possible for man to live. If, while the master remains calm, the mind is ceaseless as heavenly movements are ceaseless, it will always be at ease in spite of countless changes in its dealings with things. As it is said, the original mind remains calm and serene, and all parts of the body obey its command. If there is no master, the vital force will simply run wild. How can the mind not be flustered? The teacher said, The great trouble of students is to be found in the love of fame. I said, A year or so ago, I thought this trouble of mine had decreased. Upon careful examination recently, I found that it has not done so at all. It is not necessarily striving for external things or acting to satisfy others. The mere fact that I am happy when I hear words of praise and depressed when I hear words of criticism shows that the trouble occurred.
quite right. Name, fame, and actuality are opposed to each other. When devotion to actuality increases a little bit, to that extent, the devotion to name decreases. If one devotes his mind entirely to actuality, he will have no mind to devote to name. If one is devoted to the search for actuality, just as one seeks food when hungry and drink when thirsty, how can he also have time to love fame? He again says, A superior man dislikes the thought of his names not being mentioned after his death. The word Chung to mention is read in the departing tone, thus meaning to weigh or balance. It is the same idea as a superior man is ashamed of a reputation beyond his merits. If in reality one is not equal to his fame, the situation can be remedied if he is still living. It will be too late, however, after death. If one reaches the age of 40 or 50 and nothing is heard of him, the phrase heard of means his hearing of the way, not his being heard of. Confucius said, to be heard of through the country is merely to be known. It is different from being distinguished. How could Confucius be satisfied with the hope of people merely to be known? I often have regrets. The teacher said, to have regrets and to realize one's mistake is comparable to medicine. It gets rid of the disease, but it is better to correct one's mistake. If the mistake is allowed to remain, you have a condition in which disease arises because of the medicine. Ta Chang said, I hear that you compare pure gold to the sage, the quantity to the sage's ability, and the work of refining to the student's effort to learn. The comparison is most profound and keen, but I am afraid it is not quite satisfactory to say that Yao and Xuan were, as it were, 10,000 pounds of gold, whereas Confucius was only 9,000. The teacher said, Again, this law is occasioned by the viewing of a person in terms of the body, and therefore you contend about the quantity in behalf. If you are not thinking of the body, then 10,000 pounds is not too much for Yao and 9,000 pounds is not too little for Confucius. The 10,000 pounds of Yao and Xuan belong to Confucius, and the 9,000 pounds of Confucius belong to Yao and Xuan. There is really no difference as to whether it was his or theirs. What is called sagehood, sagehood depends only on the refinement and singleness of mind and not on quantity. As long as people are equal in their complete identification with the principle of nature, they are equally sages. As to ability, power, and spiritual energy in handling affairs, how can all people be equal in them? Later scholars have confined their comparison to quantity and have therefore drifted into the doctrine of success and profit. If everybody gets rid of the idea of comparing quantity and devotes his energy and spirit entirely to the effort of becoming completely identified with the principle of nature, everyone will become self-contained, everyone will be perfectly realized. The great will become great and the small will become small, each being self-sufficient without depending on the pursuit of external things.
This is the real and concrete task of manifesting the good and making the personal life sincere. Later scholars do not understand the doctrines of this age. They do not know how to realize their innate knowledge and innate ability directly through personal experience and extend them in their own minds, but instead seek to know what they cannot know and do what they cannot do. They hope single-mindedly only for exalted position, and they admire greatness. They do not know they have the evil mind of the wicked king, Che and Cho. At every turn, they attempt to undertake the task of the sage emperors, Yao and Shun. How could they succeed? They toil year in and year out until they die in old age. I don't know what they will have accomplished. What a pity. I asked, a former scholar considered the mind in its tranquil state as substance and the mind in its active state as function. What about it? The teacher said, the substance and function of the mind cannot be equated with its tranquil and active states. Tranquility and activity are matters of time. When we speak of substance as substance, function is already involved in it. And when we speak of function as function, substance is already involved in it. This is what is called substance and function coming from the same source. However, there is no harm in saying that the substance of the mind is revealed through its tranquility and its function through its activity. I asked, why can't the most intelligent and the most stupid be changed. The teacher said, it is not that they cannot be changed, it is merely that they are unwilling to change. I asked about the chapter in the Analects in which the pupils of Sisha asked Sisha 503 to 450 BC about the principles of friendship. The teacher said, when Sisha said, to associate with those who are fit for you and avoid those not fit for you. He was talking about the friendship of young people. When Zichang said that the superior man honors the worthy and gets along with all and praises the good and pities the incompetent, he was talking about the friendship of adults. If followed carefully, both are correct. So then, asked, is it not a pleasure to learn and to repeat or practice from time to time what has been learned? A former scholar regarded learning as following the conduct of those who are the first to be enlightened. What do you think? The teacher said, to learn is to get rid of selfish human desires and to preserve the principle of nature. If we devote ourselves to getting rid of selfish human desires and preserving the principle of nature, we will naturally be as correct as those who are the first to be enlightened. When we go into the ancient meaning of the term learning, in its derived meaning, it involves questioning, the sifting of ideas, thinking, deliberation, the preservation of the mind, self-examination, self-mastery, and other efforts. But all these are no more than the effort to get rid of selfish human desires from the mind and preserve the principle of nature in the mind. To say that it is to follow the conduct of those who are the first to be enlightened is to mention only one item of the process of learning, and one seems to be seeking it entirely outside himself. To learn with a constant perseverance and application does not mean, in the case of sitting like a boy impersonating an ancestor in a sacrifice, for example, merely to practice how to sit, but to practice the attitude of mind while sitting, and in the case of standing reverently as in sacrificing, does not mean merely to practice standing, but to practice the attitude of mind while standing.
The word pleasure is the same word as in Pentius is saying that moral principles that please our mind. The human mind, by nature, delights in moral principles very much as the eye delights in beauty and the ear in music. If they do not, it is only because they are blinded and spoiled by selfish human desires. Now, as selfish human desires are gradually removed, the mind will be increasingly harmonious with moral principles. How can it help being delighted? Boyan said, Although Song Tzu was genuine in his daily examining himself on three points, I am afraid these examinations were undertaken because he had not heard of the doctrine of one thread, Iquan, that runs through all the teachings of Confucius. The teacher said, Confucius told Song Tzu about the one thread because he realized that Song Tzu had not found the essentials of moral cultivation. If the student can really devote himself to conscientiousness and altruism, are they not the one thread running through all? The one is comparable to the roots of a tree and the thread to its branches and leaves. If the roots have not been cultivated, how can there be branches and leaves? Substance and function come from the same source. If substance is not firmly established, how can function proceed? When Zhu Xi said that Song Tzu had, in this fear of function, carefully examined matters as they came along and practiced them vigorously, but had not realized their substance as one, I'm afraid he was not in complete accord with truth. 